Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. We live at a moment when basic Western values are under pressure, when democracies, especially the United States, seem uncertain about what kind of world they really want, and when the global institutional architecture is demonstrably outdated. At the same time, it is also a moment when autocrats are increasingly emboldened, not only aggressively moving away from what many had thought were accepted global norms and how they treat their own citizens, but also challenging the West in ways that seem to be reminiscent of the early decades of the 20th century. My guest today, Anne Applebaum, is a frontline observer of these profound and dangerous changes in how the world works. She is an unusual combination of journalist and historian, which means she is writing not just the first, but also the second draft of history. She is also a fellow at the SNF Agora Institute, on whose board I sit. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. Your November cover story for The Atlantic, The Bad Guys Are Winning, has become required reading for everyone thinking about geopolitics. Is it fair to summarize your core insight that autocrats, Putin, Xi, the Iranians, Lukashenko, others, are united not by ideology, but by their desire to survive, whereas the rest of us seem united by less and less? It's a little bit more than just their desire to survive, although that's, of course, the core of it. They're also united by their dislike of, fear of, and um, desire to repress uh, democracies and democratic activists in their own countries. Um, So the language of democracy, the language of rights, the language of the rule of law, the language of free speech or free association, they feel these things to be, you know, in some cases, personal threats to them or, or to their regimes. And they are willing to cooperate with one another, even though, in theory, they have very little in common ideologically, um, to make sure that democratic movements and groups don't succeed anywhere. Um, And so that means that, um, you know, working across ideological lines, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, even the Turkish government are willing to support the government of Venezuela through investment through trade, through deals, um, you know, they, they're, they're keeping alive a regime in Venezuela that's deeply unpopular um, and deeply corrupt. Uh, same is true in Belarus, uh, another country that's supported largely by the Russians, but also has a big Chinese investment. Cubans have defended the Belarusian regime, um, which is you know, now profoundly violent um, and kleptocratic at the UN. Um, you know, Iranians are, are negotiating with the Belarusians too. And so these are, these are all examples of the ways in which autocracies now work together to support one another, um, even in way, you know, even, even across traditional geographical and, and historical links. During the 21st century, we've had uh, the Arab Spring, which more or less failed. And we've had the color revolutions, which more or less succeeded, although lots of nuances and all of that. Um, How have those experiences affected the autocrats? Has it made them more worried about their own people or more confident that these things can be crushed? Um, I mean, I would be careful about using failed or success in either of those cases um, because revolutions have very long lives. Um, You know, if you look at what happened in 1848, this was a series of revolutions, democratic revolutions in Europe in the 19th century. Um, almost all of them ended badly. And yet several decades later, um, some of the liberal ideas, the the ideas about parliaments and rights um, were accepted all across Europe. And so um, failure, you know, is often short term and as can be success, of course, and, and, you know, achievements can be reversed. Um, But yes, I think it's true that autocracies now understand in a very deep way that democracy is contagious and that people watch, you know, in one country can watch, um, you know, a revolution on the other side of the world and certainly a revolution in the country next door 
um, and look for, look at and watch tactics and look at examples and understand how it is that people have succeeded. And this is more or less, of course, what the Arab Spring was. Um, a, a revolution in Tunisia was then followed by ones in Egypt and followed by another one in Libya. And that was because um, people understood that these, you know, they, they saw from one example that these um, Arab dictatorships were much weaker than they than they seem to be. Um, although, of course, I would say on the contrary, you know, autocracy is also in that sense contagious in that autocrats also look to one another what techniques are being used to repress dem democracies in one area. Um, you know, how, how are the Russians using disinformation? How are the Chinese using surveillance technology? Um, you know, how are, you know, the state companies of Iran, you, you know, use, using their... Uh, using their power to, you know, to prop up the state companies in another country. Um, so th those kinds of those kinds of tactics are also learned. Um, but 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 to your question, I mean, yes, it's the it's the it's the contagiousness, it's the spread, it's the way in which these revolutions imitate one another uh, that definitely frightens the autocrats the most. Let's talk about a couple of those autocrats. Uh, Putin has massed troops on the Ukrainian border. Uh, he's dragged his feet on providing enough gas to Europe to keep houses warm this winter. Uh, he's demanded a negotiation with the United States that would essentially redraw the security map uh, of at least Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, how much of this is Putin, in your judgment, how much of this is Putin being Putin and how much is it is Western weakness or some combination of both? It's very hard to separate them. I mean, P Putin um, is who he is because he continues to test the West and to push against limits. Um, and, you know, contrary to the, you know, dozens of, uh, you know, would-be clever journalists and writers who claim this is a new Cold War and so on. I mean, the, the only country in this, in, you know, in Europe that wants this Cold War and that wants this conflict is Russia. And Western countries and certainly Eastern European countries would go a long way to avoid a war or placate Russia or, you know, f you know, let's just trade instead or let's just do deals instead. Um, but it's in Putin's personal interests, I believe he thinks it's to do with the safety of his regime, to continue being belligerent and to continue um, undermining the West and exposing the West as weak because that helps him stay in power at home. You know, he's he's presiding over a... Um, you know, a, a country that's getting poorer. Um, it's had a particularly bad experience with COVID. Um, Russian hospitals are in chaos. Um, terrible stories have come out. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, his, his, his popularity by whatever means that we can judge it, it's very difficult in a, in a dictatorship, but it seems to be at a real low point. Um, and so he needs some kind of grand gesture, you know, in order to stay in power. And one of the ways in which he can make himself look good, both to his, population and also to the security guards and and sort of security apparatus rather around him um, is to seem like a big a big man on the on the international stage and I think that's probably what this is really about um, you know the, the the danger is is that he might also you know now that he's coming to you know he's kind of getting older he's um, looking for some kind of place in history the danger is that he might also now be thinking seriously about recreating or um or reconstituting a part of the old soviet union again and i i do worry that although it would be irrational and although i didn't see how it could be a long term success it is possible that he could launch another war in addition to the one that he's already fighting in ukraine um, just to build up his image, just to make himself look tough, just to scare the West, and just to show, um, just to show how powerless it is. Um, so, so as I say, there's a the the you know if you look at it slightly differently, you know, imagine a different circumstance in which Ukraine, instead of becoming a kind of tool or a game, for, you know, for Trump, whereby he he played games with the Ukrainian president and sought to you know, get him to help him find dirt on Joe Biden. Imagine that um, instead we'd spent the last five years training Ukrainian soldiers and arming Ukraine. Um, we would then not be in this situation. You know, we've forgotten that the point of the Western alliance and the point of being an ally of the United States and of the NATO powers is to be safe and to deter the Russians. And we haven't been willing to extend that deterrence and we haven't been willing to build it up on our own side. 
um, Europeans are not at all willing to spend on on security, and they mostly because they simply didn't feel that it's necessary. They haven't been made to feel that yet. Um, and the United States is far away and also doesn't feel it. So, so as I say, it's a, it's a kind of dance of both sides where Putin sees a weakness. He sees that the West doesn't want to fight. And so he's continuing to provoke in order to build up his, his personal image. The Soviet Union reference reminds me that you recently wrote that Putin certainly wants to use the past to stay in power. And he's, he's brought all of these things out of the closet, the, the national anthem, uh, Stalin is, is now a great man in history once again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it raises two questions. One, he's obviously doing that. Um, we, however, in the West also seem to be playing with our history, although in a more negative sort of fashion. It's all about colonialism and empires and civil wars, history, slavery, undoing things without an alternative narrative that has yet taken hold. You're a historian. Those two processes seem like ships passing in opposite directions in the night. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you think about it, both what they're doing and what we seem to be doing in a less coed sort of way? I mean, I'm not sure they are related. Um, you know, the, the Soviet, um, sorry, I should say the post-Soviet, the Putinist reassessment of Soviet history is all about keeping Putin in power and creating a narrative that um, justifies his dictatorship. Um, and part of the justification is that he, he, you know, he's established this kind of link to Russia's imperial, the Russia, the moment of Russian imperial glory in 1945, when the Soviet Union, um, you, know, just, you know, occupied half of Europe. Um, and he wants to re-invoke those days and those memories because they seem to, you know, he thinks they'll make Russians proud and nostalgic. And he wants to be connected to that feeling of nostalgia and national pride. Um, I mean, the arguments over history in the United States seem to me to be happening for different kinds of reasons. I mean, they're not coming from, um, you know, they're not coming from a, a, you know, a dictator who's trying to change the narrative. They're, they're arguments really between different American groups about who we are and what's important. Um, and, you know, here I have to, you know, I want to, you know, not be misunderstood. I mean, the, but the, there is a, there is a danger that history in America will come to be seen, you know, certain aspects of history will become to be seen as partisan or, you know, we can't tell the truth because that makes our side look bad or vice versa. Um, and, you know, in, in America, what's always been important about history is, is you know, re re reading it in a way that emphasizes both what was, you know, unfortunate and, and, and negative and bad in our past, but at the same time, what was good in our past and how we can learn from both and how they can unite us and strengthen our democracy. Um, and I do worry that um, some you know, kind of history partisans are now looking to use history for different reasons um, to do contemporary politics and to accuse one another or, um, I don't know, to, to, to you know, to, to, to use the past as a way of undermining, you know, their opponents. Um, and that's, that would be unfortunate because one, one of the things that our common past can do is, is bring us together. And without that sense of a common past, a common shared history and a common, sort of public space, um, then it's very hard to have a democracy. And it's also very hard to confront those who are trying to undermine your democracy. And that, that's where I was, that's where I was going with the, trying to connect those dots, not that they're similar processes, but rather that they can contribute to this sense on, in the West of confusion, uncertainty, and a real lack of, of coherence across what used to be a fairly coherent alliance. And that might be dangerous in this world. Um, yes, it's very dangerous. I mean, the lack of coherence, the lack of a sense um, of who we are and what our values are, the, the, the removal of the idea of democracy as something central to what America is, um, whether American foreign policy or American domestic policy, I think, and which is kind of a process that started a decade ago um, and accelerated madly during the Trump administration. I think this has been extremely damaging, both for the United States and for America's partners. Um, you know, the, you know, the Western alliance as it was, or really the alliance of international democracies, because I would include Asian democracies and 
South American and African democracies too, um, without American leadership and without a sense of, um, you know, you know, a, a sense of mutually agreed values um, is very hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine how it works or what it can do. And it isn't working terribly well and it's not doing very much to your point. Um, uh, no, <laughs> no. I mean, it's, 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 you know, we right now, um, you know, there are a number of new challenges that are not just to the United States, but to the democracies as a whole that we don't really have an answer for. You know, one example is um, transnational repression. This is a you know, name that's been given to the tendency of autocratic states to attack, murder, kidnap, um, or, or in any, somehow reach out into other countries in order to um, destroy their political opponents or murder them. Um, this is, you know, you think of the Russians murdering, you know, or attempting to murder people in Salisbury, England, or in Berlin. Um, think of the Chinese kidnapping their citizens in various parts of the world. Um, think of the Chinese threatening their citizens or ex-citizens when the, you know, the Chinese communities around the world. Um, you know, think of the Iranians trying to kidnap an Iranian journalist in, who lived in Brooklyn. I mean, there's a there's a whole series of these kinds of, um, you know, these kinds of things that, you know, it's no longer a a one-off thing or something that happens once in a while. It's now a permanent feature of international life. And we don't really have a response to it yet. We don't have a way of thinking about it or talking about it. We don't have a um, sanctions that seem strong enough to push back against them. Um, and so, you, you know, unless we're willing to act as a whole, as, you know, as a, as a, as a transatlantic alliance or as an alliance of democracies, it's very hard to see how we can, um, we can stop these kinds of things from happening and hold people accountable. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. You have recently been reporting from the Polish-Belarus border and coined this phrase, the weaponization of desperation. Um, it is a magnificent turn of phrase about an ugly situation. Um, and it is, it, it's part of that same idea that the bad guys are really quite creative at the moment um, in, in a lot of different ways. And we have, we, the West, have not been terribly creative, coherent, about how we talk about these issues or, or what we do about these issues. Um, and, and you have gone further and argued that we really need to do something about it. We really need to think about them differently and maybe come up with some new new solutions. So that, the, that phrase was, was about something very specific, which is the Belarusian dictator's deliberate import of would-be immigrants from the Middle East to Minsk. Um, they were then taken from Minsk to the first to the Lithuanian border and then to the Polish border and helped to cross illegally. I mean, Belarusian guards would cut the, you know, wire fences um, and show people, you know, and show people how to cross. And this became very dangerous and, um, um, you, you know, even lethal because, you know, people were, you know, people with no preparation and, you know, no food sometimes and not the right kind of clothes found themselves in Eastern European forests in the late fall or early winter where it was very cold. Um, you know, there was then, a, you know, they were then sometimes pushed back over the border by, um, by Polish or by Lithuanian guards. They were then, you know, pushed back again by the Belarusians. And there were these horrible stories of people being stuck in the forest for days or weeks um, but but the but the core of the problem is that it started with um, again you know as I said the, the 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 dictator of Belarus seeing this as a kind of opportunity to take revenge on Poland and on Lithuania who were countries who criticized him for his um, as I said brutal crackdown on dissidents it's not an entirely new idea um, it's you know the Turks have tried this a little bit in Greece there was a version of this in Morocco I mean there's, there, these are this has happened. Um, once or twice before, but this was a particularly egregious version of it because there, of course, there are no Middle Eastern immigrants naturally to be found in Minsk. I mean, they could only be brought there on airplanes, you know, imported for that reason. Um, so it wasn't as if you had desperate people in, you know, in, in refugee camps trying to cross the border. This was something else. This was the creation of, of, of a problem rather than the expression of one. 
Um, but yes, I mean, um, thinking differently about how to fight back against this, how to, um, you know, what, how is it possible to ne negotiate these things? How can, how can we rethink, you know, borders more broadly and what we're going to do about this, you know, massive problem of refugees around the world? I mean, there's, there's almost no serious high level conversation about, um, you know, about how to confront the dictatorships and how to confront the holes in our own system. I mean, one of the things my piece also does is that it talks about the influence that, um, you know, that autocracies now have inside democracies um, and the influence can come from, you know, disinformation or propaganda that has been successfully um, spread inside democracies, but it can also come from um, buying influence um, through business deals um, sometimes through personal connections, through, you know, attempts to influence political parties. Um, and unfortunately, the West has been, has been, has also been very open to these kinds of approaches. And, you know, is, you know, there's now a real kind of almost symbiosis, certainly, um, you know, China and America have a very, very complicated relationship now that would be extremely hard to pick apart. Um, and where deal, you know, business begins or ends and where political influence begins or ends is very difficult to say. Um, but thinking differently about all these relationships, I think, is something that will have to happen in the next few years um, if the autocracies aren't to continue making gains around the world. Uh, as you know, Putin and uh, Chinese President Xi recently had a virtual summit. Um, buried in the communique was a a hope that they can create an alternative financial system. Um, it's gotten almost no attention, but it dovetails nicely with what you've just discussed. Uh, we have a system that has worked quite nicely for us uh, for decades in terms of growth and prosperity in the West, uh, maybe in other parts of the world. Um, it is a dollar-based system. It's a West-based system, and it's eroded badly at the edges. And it now looks like um, it's not just a question of Germans becoming too reliant on Russian gas, perhaps, um, but it might become where we're getting towards a point where the basic structures of this period, including the financial structures, uh, could be getting shaky. How do we get out of this? How, how do we begin thinking differently, to use your, your, your phrase? I mean, I don't have a formula. Um, I certainly think we should be prepared for the idea that Russia and China will create an alternative financial system. Um, and we should make sure that ours is watertight. Um, you know, we should be thinking so we should be several steps ahead of this process rather than being constantly caught by surprise. Um, almost every time, you know, there's some new outrage or some new violation of the of the rules or of the you know what some people call the rules-based international order or 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 simply of the financial system you know we seem to be surprised i mean i think we now need to start from the assumption that it you know these rules will be violated and we need to you know you know maybe at some point circle the wagons and figure out who's who's going to be inside our system and who wants to continue to be part of it and and who doesn't and we need to make sure that the um, the rules are watertight. I mean, there are other ways of thinking about this too. I mean, the West needs to also think about how it can create systems that, you know, that are more attractive. I mean, for example, that right now the Western financial system, you know, as you say, it's fine as far as it goes. The rules have made all of us actually more prosperous, um, but it also has tremendous loopholes and autocracies have been using the Western banking system, for example, to, um, you know, to launder money, to steal money, to plant money around the world. Um, and that is also part of how they stay in power. Um, I think making sure that doesn't happen anymore, eliminating the loopholes, um, making it much harder to, um, to for, you know, for, for, for Russia or China or, or anybody to export um, corruption to the West or to use the Western system, you know, to protect themselves you know, as corrupt as corrupt individuals or corrupt states is something we need to work on. I mean, I would say there are two big things. There are two big holes right now in um, sort of in, you know, in the Western system. One of them is that one, you know, the, the, the kleptocracy. Um, the other is the Internet and the way in which we have allowed it to be so easily manipulated by people who 
you know, of ill will and having some kind of alternative to the Chinese internet or to the autocratic internet, which we all know now what that looks like. Um, you know, some forms of social media that are um, designed to create better conversations and consensus rather than aggression and emotion. Um, beginning to think a little bit more seriously. I don't, I don't want to use the word regulation of the internet, but of promotion, you know, having a better model of the internet is something that we need to do, I think, pretty quickly. So a few years ago, we would perhaps have been having a very different conversation because we had this notion that we were all evolving. It was the extreme globalization or globalized world, uh, not quite kumbaya, but kumbaya. We're all going to be on the same page, not the end of history, but, but the end of aggression, perhaps. That obviously not the world you've been describing that we live in, in fact. Uh, so how do we get from where we actually are to a better place? Where do those conversations start? Well, the, so the democracy summit that Joe Biden held in December, um, you know, was not a bad start. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a small event. It didn't get a huge amount of media attention. Um, but it was one of the first times that the world's democracies at quad democracies were pulled together. This was an, this was an online conversation between several dozen states, actually. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just the Western Alliance. Um, and, you know, some of the topics that were on the table were the ones I discussed. One of them was corruption and the other is um, governance of the Internet. Um, and so beginning to think about how we have at least some of our foreign policy conversations in that group um, with those, you know, with with countries that are interested in spreading and sharing those values. I mean, it can't be our only foreign policy because we have to continue talking to China and their there are other non-democracies who are, you know, who are allies of ours. Um, but but having conversations in that group among that among people who are interested in share, you know, in sharing those values is is, is part of the beginning. Um, putting putting those ideas at the center of American foreign policy also helps. I mean, it's and Biden himself has said a number of times that he you know, that he wants democracy to be back at the center of American foreign policy, um, you know, but he hasn't, you know, there, unfortunately, so much is going on in Washington, um, including the decline of democracy in the United States, which he needs to fight, that I don't feel he's had the time or the, you know, or the energy really to promote this, this set of ideas. But, um, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that the administration has started it and I'm pleased that the summit took place and I'm pleased that it got some people thinking in other capitals around the world. Why don't we end there? Because I think um, we do need new thinking. Um, we need a much broader conversation, not just, and I use air quotes on the word leaders because leadership extends far beyond just political leaders, obviously. Um, it indeed, I, I referenced the SNF uh, Agora at, at Johns Hopkins. Part of the concept there indeed is to broaden the conversation across public, private sector, academic, non-academic, civil society, et cetera. Um, and indeed, some of your writing pushes in that direction because it provides ideas for those conversations. Um, but that really is... I think the single greatest solution to much of what you've been arguing that having this much broader conversation that is forward looking, that isn't just reactive, uh, can begin to rebuild, to build something new that, that maybe is more viable than uh, a system which has gotten a little bit tired. Yeah. I, as I said, you know, beginning to think, what are the positive alternatives that we can create? What is, what is the internet that we want? You know, what is the, you know, how do we, what would we like it to look like? Instead of thinking reactively, you know, how do we take, what do we, what don't we like and what can we, what can we take down or control? What is the alternative? What should it look like? You know, what kind of financial system would we like to have? How could we make it more honest, um, more fair? Um, you know, and beginning to think along those lines, I think could make a big difference because, you know, we have to make sure that, um, you know, democracy and the rule of law and um, the ideas of, you know, freedom and justice, that these aren't just slogans, but that they work and they're, they're intrinsic to all of our institutions. Um, you know, and, and I would finish by saying, 
you know, the, these democracy movements that the Russians and the Chinese and the Belarusians and the and the Myanmar junta and the and the Venezuelans are so afraid of. I mean, these are in a way the greatest testament to the ongoing power of those ideas. So even in countries where they really are deprived of rights and where they can't vote for who for their leaders and where there isn't the rule of law and they can be anybody can be arrested at any time for any reason if someone wants to arrest them. I mean, all of that is um, you know, the, the you know the the, the fact that the idea that that is wrong, you know, it remains, you know, so fundamental to so many people, um, I think is encouraging. And we should, you know, keep, remember that that should be our fundamental supposition, too. I couldn't agree more. So thank you very much for that and, and for this entire conversation. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation.